Okay, then. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us for Chicagoland Laboratory for 20th Century Design Innovations. My name is Tanner Woodford. I am founder and executive director of the Design Museum of Chicago. As an organization, we look at design very broadly using a wide lens. This is true of our ex exhibitions and programs, but also our partnerships. This way of thinking is evident in the 100 Great Designs of Modern Times as published by Fortune in partnership with the Institute of Design. The list includes a wide range of objects from the Eames fiberglass armchair to the Apollo 11 spacecraft and so much in between. I'm honored to have suggested and written about two objects for the list and you will hear much more about this this evening. This inclusive approach is also reflected in the Design Museum's retreat, a free virtual asynchronous conference taking place until Sunday this week. Check it out for free at retreatmenice.com. That's retreatmenice.com. I'll put a link to, in the chat in a minute. Pre-recorded talks will range from topics like a shaker chair with Maggie Taft to black creative mental health awareness presented by Where Are the Black Designers? More specifically, tonight's program looks back at mid-century design to understand its influence in our lives today, particularly in our homes where we are spending so much of our time lately. Of course, this is all framed up perfectly by Modern in the Middle. I'm putting a link in the chat to this publication now. Uh, and you'll hear a lot more about this publication in the talk. So with that, I'll turn it over to Amina, our moderator for the evening. Amina is a second year student in ID's foundation and MDES program who is interested in the language and artifacts that shape our realities and how this informs our collective response to a changing climate. Amina. Thank you, Tanner. So I would like to call out um, that with tonight's event, we're really celebrating two occasions. So firstly, the publication of Modern in the Middle, Chicago Houses um, from 1929 to 1975. We're gonna see some more um, glimpses and a peek into this book uh, later into the talk. And secondly, today is Jay Doblin's 100th birthday. So we're gonna use today's conversation as a space to reflect on influences from the mid-century of domestic design and architecture in Chicago and gather lessons from that time for what we can learn today and into the future. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First off, we have Michelangelo Sabatino, who is the co-author of Modern in the Middle. He's also a professor and director of the PhD program at IIT's College of Architecture. As an educator, academic administrator, curator, and scholar, Michelangelo has shaped discourse and practice in the Americas and beyond. Next up, we have Marty Thaler, a studio professor at IIT's Institute of Design. He's an expert on product design and Marty contributed to ID's collaborative research project with Fortune Magazine, which is the 100 Great Designs of Modern Times that uh, Tana referred to earlier. This undertook um, a re-examination of Jay Doblin's earlier study done 60 years prior. Next up, we have Marsha Weiss, an award-winning interior designer and artist. Whether she's planning spaces, designing rugs and furniture, or making art, Marsha creates dynamic and restorative environments. Exposure to these intersecting worlds of design came early for her growing up in Chicago, surrounded by the work of her architect father, Harry Weiss, and her mother, the interior designer, Kitty Baldwin Weiss. Last but not least, we have Bud Rodecker, who is the founder and design director of the multidisciplinary design firm, SPAN. Um, here, he one of the key projects most recently was designing Modern in the Middle, but outside of his studio work, Bud explores the process of creativity through self-initiated experiments and teaching design at DePaul University. So before we kick off the conversation, a couple housekeeping notes. This conversation is being recorded and it'll be shared with everyone who registered through the Eventbrite. Um, we're gonna start off with about 20 minutes where our panelists are gonna share stories and slides that will build the foundation of our conversation today. From there, we'll move on to a moderated discussion and then an open Q&A. So given that, I encourage everyone to submit questions through our chat feed in the Zoom window. We're gonna monitor these questions for our Q&A session at the end. And lastly, as Tanner mentioned, I'm guessing all of us um, are probably tuning into this conversation from our homes or we're spending so much of our time today, these days really. So during tonight's panel, I encourage everyone to um, take a look around your homes and observe your surroundings and see if you can find any of these influences from the mid-century present in our homes today. So with that, we're going to pull up the slides and I'm going to pass it over to Michelangelo. Thank you, Amina.
Good evening. Uh, next. Good evening, all. Given this evening's densely packed program, please consider my brief introduction to Modern in the Middle, more of a finger food offering than a sit-down meal. Uh, in addition to my co-author, Susan Benjamin, who is attending but not presenting this evening, I wish to express thanks to the hosts, and in particular, Kristen Geeken of IIT's Institute of Design, Dennis Weil, Dean of ID, and last, but certainly not least, the fabulous team at the Design Museum of Chicago, Tanner Woodford and Lauren Vulgan. The title, Modern in the Middle, assumes three layers of meaning. The most obvious reference to middle relates to the Chicago's a geographical location in the US. Additionally, the clients who commissioned the modern houses generally tend to be middle and upper middle class professionals who identified with progressive values. Finally, while the chronological arc of our book starts with the late 20s and continues to the mid 70s, the 30s through 60s typically associated with mid-century years uh, do indeed cover a substantial period. Next. Next. This evening's program, oh, sorry. Uh, this evening's program is focused on the house as a site for design innovation on a number of different scales and uses, ranging from chairs and housewares to architecture itself. The Roby and the Farnsworth House seen here established Chicago as a laboratory for 20th century design. Yet, as the contents of our book reveal, there are many more protagonists to this multifaceted story than a handful of iconic houses. And above all, there is more to Chicago's design history than just architecture. Next. Seen in this beautiful aerial drawing by Homer Groman, the network of Chicago land neighborhoods, cities and villages discussed in our book extend to the north, west and south of the loop and are linked together by train and automobiles. Next. Susan Benjamin's essay in our, our book discusses, discusses Mies and Wright as the giants in the room. This evening, we have another job, uh, giant, and that is Jay Doblin, whose transformational tenure at, the, at ID started shortly after Mies' uh, departure. To the right is a photo of Doblin in Crown Hall, and to the left is Mies towering over Crown Hall in a photo taken by ID professor of photography, Arthur Siegel. Next. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to take that back, uh, uh, Kristen, if you can go back to, in the slides that follow, I will show historic photos of houses published in our book, coupled with some of the selections made by Doblin for his landmark book published in 1970, 100 Great Product Designs. My objective here is to reveal to the audience the richness of collaboration between architects and designers, both inside and outside of IIT, of course, throughout the decades taken into consideration. Next. The one story Isabella Gardner and Robert Hall McCormick third house is one of the two single family houses designed for Chicago area clients by Mies. The house completed in 1952 was conceived as a prototype for affordable mass produced modular homes with the client McCormick and Herbert S. Greenwald as co-developers. In this Hedrick Blessing photo of the living area, we see the Barcelona chair included by Doblin in his survey alongside the then recently launched daybed by Jordan Nelson of 1950. Next. Located in the affluent city of Lake Forest, the house Winston Elting designed for himself and his spouse at the time, Marjorie Horton, and their family blends modern attitudes towards massing, plan, and siting with organic materiality. Here, we see the main bathroom with a then recently launched New Vogue bathroom suite of 1937, designed by Henry Dreyfus, Dreyfus rather, and produced by Chicago-based Crane Company. Next. William Decknatel designed a house in Evanston for a prominent Northwestern University English pro literature professor, Lambert H. Ennis, and his wife, Ellen U.B. Ennis. Its design reflects Decknatel's training at the Taliesin Fellowship. Decknatel's spouse, Geraldine, was trained as an interior designer and often collaborated with him. Here we see a Hedrick Blessing photograph of the kitchen with revereware, also selected by Doblin, prominently displayed. Next. In one of the two introductory essays of our book, I discuss the role that designers like Russell Wright played in shaping the American domestic landscape. 
During the late 1930s, when American Modern was launched, the architectural profession in this country was gradually being transformed by the arrival of European emigres whose approaches and insights expanded the design, both directly and indirectly, of the American house. Many of these emigres held Frank Lloyd Wright in high esteem, so the divide between organicism and rationalism was hardly as great as some interpreters of the period claimed. Next. The industrial designer Henry P. Glass designed a house for his family in Northfield that was completed in 1948. Though Glass trained as an architect and engineer in Vienna before coming to Chicago, he went on to make a considerable impact in his adoptive city. Next. The, the Dr. Edith Farnsworth House is among the most written about and photographed 20th century buildings. The Primavera wood-clad freestanding core in the center is flanked by a galley kitchen seen here with cabinets manufactured by St. Charles Kitchens located in nearby Plano and by a continuous kitchen top produced by LK, a company that is still in business in Broadview, Illinois, just around the corner from where I live in Riverside. Next. The Drucker House, designed by Reese's, Harry Weiss's sister Suzanne and Robert Drucker, located in Wilmette, was built in 1954. Seen in this photo is Alba Alto's four-legged stackable stool developed in the early 30s and Charles Eames' plywood chair launched in 1947, both of which covered by Doblin. Next. Weiss was born in Evanston and trained at MIT in Cranbrook Academy of Arts in Bloomfield, Hills, Michigan. There he was exposed to the school's design ethos that was centered upon the integration of art, design, and architecture. Here is the 1961 issue of Chicago-based Playboy, where we see important Cranbrook protagonists, such as Henry Bertoia, Errol Sarnan, and Charles Eames. Next. In the post-war years, smaller, smaller yet highly influential Retail stores like the one seen in the right, such as Baldwin Kingry, established by architect Harry Weiss, his wife, and interior designer Kitty Baldwin Weiss, and friend Jody Kingry, made it possible for consumers to purchase affordable designed objects and furniture by Alta, Bertoia, and Eames for their modern homes. The, mod the American mo uh, Furniture Mart opened in 24, followed by the Merchandise Mart in 1930, seen here on the left with a showroom by Gilbert Roby, Brody, both of which contained wholesale showrooms, were located in prominent positions, rather prominent buildings. Next. From 1950 to 1955, Chicago's Merchandise Mart and MoMA collaborated to host good design exhibitions. This is one of the Chicago showrooms designed by A. James Spire in 1954. Next. The modernist Marjorie Handler and William Ganster House in Waukegan, designed by Ganster for his family, seen here um, in this evening photo with an alto design table and chairs, is one of the unsung jewels featured in our book. To the right, we see a photo of Kitty Weiss with younger daughters, Marsha and Shirley Weiss, in a Barwa chair designed by ID grad Edgar Bartolucci and launched in 1950. As you see in the upper right, Dolan included Alto's bent plywood chairs in his survey. Next. Another photo on the right of Marsha Weiss as toddler, and we're gonna to meet uh, Marsha shortly, and she's gonna share her own experiences, but here we see her as a toddler in the so-called Yellow House of 1952, designed by Weiss in Barrington, and to the left, uh, the earlier 1948 water house, also in Barrington. Here you see how Weiss makes the most use of the house's small footprint right, by introducing a revolving cabinetry component, kitchen cabinetry component that can be opened and closed according to need. Next. The same type of spatial inventiveness resurfaces in Weiss's subsequently designed studio house, also in Barrington, seen here. Next. Textile designer Ben Rose and his spouse Francis Landrum, a weaver and his business partner, selected A. James Spire, Mises' first graduate student, to design their house in Highland Park. David Hayde, another talented IIT grad, later designed on the same site the automobile pavilion made famous in John Hughes's 1976 film Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Later in his life, Ben Rose became a serious collector of automobiles, like the one we see in the image on the right of the auto pavilion. Next. Finally, 
as evidence that my partner Serge Ambrose and I talk the talk and walk the walk is this modern house. For the past four years, Serge and I have been working on the preservation and renovation of the Francis J. and Silva ben Vala Benda House, designed by architect Winston Elting for Riverside in 1939. Serge, who you see hanging off the ladder next to me in a Bauhaus style photo, took the lead on the preservation renovation of this house while uh, with me providing the historical research and occasionally even some of the grunt labor, more, more occasionally than I wanted it frankly, but that's par for the course. Although the process required equal doses of perseverance, patience, and a bit of obsessive folly, it has proven a worthwhile endeavor, and we encourage others to take on similar cha challenges. Thank you. At this point, next. Apologizing for a couple minutes over time, I will hand on the baton, over the baton to Professor Marty Thaler, my esteemed IT colleague, to extend the Dublin trajectory into the 21st century. Thanks, Michelangelo. Uh, very appropriate image. It's kind of a marathon, as you said. We gotta like go through, uh, speed through 12 slides in eight minutes. So uh, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks again to the team tonight on this uh, occasion of uh, Jay Doblin's birth 100 years ago this very day, December 10th. Um, the image you see here is also of Jay Doblin, a little bit later years. That's the way kind of we, we remember him mostly at the Institute of Design as this smiling figure with a beard. Uh, the previous image you guys saw uh, of him in Crown Hall is this very confident professional uh, industrial designer um, who just uh, was practicing at the probably their premier design firm in the country, Raymond Lowy and Associates. But you have to remember that industrial design was a pretty new uh, discipline at that point. Also later um, in 81, Doblin started a, a consultancy with Larry Keeley and uh, we they used this, they were affectionately made these people, which we talk of as Doblin heads whenever they were referring to uh, people and diagrams. Uh, next slide. Of course, he was the uh, director at Institute of Design. So uh, specifically tonight, we're, we're going to examine a little bit more this uh, very important article that Jay put together for Fortune Magazine, the 100 Best Design Products by Jay Doblin in 1959. You can see it's a collection of 100 objects. Number one started with the one that got the most votes in the article. Next slide. And as Amina said, we revisited this 60 years later for Fortune Magazine and uh, developed this article for them, The Greatest Designs of Modern Times, which brought it up to the common era. Uh, the number one voted object was the iPhone. But you have to remember that our view of design and product design has changed quite dramatically since those early times. And in Jay's time, it was mostly about objects. We included things as uh, was said, uh, before by uh, Tanner. Things on our list included the Apollo 11 spacecraft, Google search, Uber, all kinds of, you know, a few other things which impact our lives. And of course, product design now includes, includes uh, UI, UX in some ways, just like the iPhone has both a physical and digital aspect to it. Next slide. I just wanted to uh, go back to a couple of these things, tell a little bit deeper story about the products in there. Um, you see the number 40, which is in the book. Um, the numbers slightly differ between the article and his Jay's book, which he wrote after the article. You see here the uh, Revereware, and that is the company going back to Paul Revere. His son took on the company. Of course, the company has changed hands many times uh, over the course of history. But the interesting thing is um, 
the story is really a manufacturing story and a mass production story. This is the introdu introduction of the first kind of stainless steel cookware. And stainless steel is not very good for heat transfer, but copper is. So it was the, the invention of combining the two along with the handle, which in this case was welded and not uh, riveted together, which made it easier to clean. You can see they're all hung up on the wall there. Next slide. I just wanted to look back. You can see also at the Farnsworth house there, you see the combination of things that, that are going on there. You also see, if you look closely, the Revere Ware kettle, also with the copper at the bottom, the stainless steel top. And you see the continuous um, LK countertop that Michelangelo talked about. Um, this was possible, and again, another Chicago innovators firm. This is possible because LK did consumer uh, commercial kitchens. So they could just make one continuous thing that formed the kitchen sink and the range and the countertop all in one piece. Next slide. There's a, Housewares plays a, a huge role in Chicago. The International Housewares Show comes every year to Chicago. And one of the companies that uh, originated it was Echo Housewares. Here you see the Flint kitchen utensil line. Previous to this, um, people just bought utensils one by one. And their innovation here was to pack them into a, a complete set and then allow you to hang them on the wall. And that was actually a little innovation to put a hole in it so you could easily grab it and get it. On our list, the 22 was the OXO Good Grips Peeler designed by Smart Design. Um, this is kind of an example of where design is going also. You see the kind of rubbery handle there. This was originated by Sam Farber of Farberware and then asked the, the design firm Smart Design did the final design, um, which was also across a huge line, a huge commercial success. This was in response to his wife's, him observing his wife who had arthritis and was trying to peel potatoes with a, an Echo Housewares probably a peeler like the one below. And then trying to create something that could work for her, which of course has application across and makes everything better for everybody. Next slide. Uh, of course, any list is going to have Charles and, importantly, Ray Eames, uh, two of the most celebrated designers of the 20th century, American designers of the 20th century. By far, the innovation here is uh, we did a lot of work developing uh, molded plywood. Here you can see the molded plywood back and uh, the seating and then the, the steel rod legs. The important thing here was a, the big breakthrough was separating those two parts uh, into a back and a seat. At one point, we were trying to uh, make the whole thing out of one molded part, which really didn't work for their technology. Next. An important, uh, you can see in both lists, this Arrow Saranen womb chair. Uh, it was commissioned by Florence Knoll. Uh, they were all friends at Cranbrook and Florence Knoll also went to the IIT Architecture School of Architecture. Uh, so there's lots of connections there. Um, uh, yeah, let's go back to that for one second. Um, she asked for a, a kind of comfy lounge chair. Um, and she also said like, women would want to put their feet up uh, on an ottoman. So make sure there's an ottoman, make sure people can have different, relax in it in very different postures. Next one. There is the Henry Dreyfus in our list. Strangely in our list and the later list, he's number 38 and he's not in uh, Jay Dobbin's original list, which is kind of surprising. Um, this Honeywell thermostat, which was present in so many homes of the era. I grew up with it as well. 
Um, it's a very simple, it's like a scientific instrument, it's the beginning of the digital things entering the home or electronics entering the home. Uh, later, you can see referencing that is the, in 2011, the Nest thermostat, which uses um, kind of advanced technology to understand new patterns um, of use and adjust the temperature according to your behaviors. Next one. The two women that are, there's only one woman in the first list and six women in the second list. Um, number 36 is Deborah Adler, who designed the Target Clearex uh, medicine bottle. Everyone's familiar with the round amber shaped bottles that most medicine comes in. Her innovation here is to create a hierarchy and a much better labeling surface, higher hierarchy of information. And the other additional thing is often, there's often several users in the home and that colored ring there kind of differentiates, say one users from the other. In the earlier list in 44, Ava Zeisel is a very renowned designer uh, and educator from Pratt Institute. She designed this Castleton dinnerware, very fluid sculptural objects. Next one. And then we get to actually the one black designer, Charles Harrison, who's from Chicago. He's very famous for the number 52, the Sawyer Viewmaster Viewer, which also entered the home around this time. It's a precursor to almost virtual reality. Every kid had one and it was a huge, massive success. Uh, he was also uh, the design director at Sears here in Chicago. And another one of the things he worked on was this molded trash can, which was all over suburbia. In the time, the innovation there is it's trash cans before that were all metal, and made lots of noise. And this one was plastic and you could nest them when you ship them. So it was, it was completely uh, a huge success as well for Sears. Next. I just wanted to end here with uh, the introduction of electronics and digital and electronic products into the, uh, into the home. Of course, we're all familiar with the living rooms with the big TV sets. It's another innovator in Chicago is Motorola and of course Zenith and the clicker was invented around this time. The remote control was a huge thing. Charles Harrison designed also many televisions which were marketed under the Sears name, but manufactured in Japan, I believe by Toshiba. But we also think about the Sony TVs and the expansion of the market of TVs being marketed as something you could have in every room. And then of course there is uh, Henry Dreyfus's uh, Bell uh, Trimline phone, which is a small culture, uh, you know, sculptural object that sat in many homes at the time. And it was 100 in Jay Dalvin's book, which was chronological, by the way. That's why it's the last one in the book. Okay, so I will hand it over to Bud, who will tell you all about how the book was designed. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm uh, design director of SPAN, along with my partner, John. Um, and we worked with uh, Michelangelo in designing this book. And so I wanted to just show some of the uh, inspiration and connections to um, design of the era uh, that went into the design and some of the other things. So this is the cover. We can go right past that slide. That's fine. Um, little preview of what the book look, lays out like. There's this running column of text and um, historical images throughout that interject in the text uh, near around where those images are being referenced. And if you go to the next slide, um, there's a little animation we made that sort of illustrates the logic by which the book is designed. So we have our grid, sort of our modernist Swiss grid, um, and the type flows into the column. And when a picture gets added, the text moves around it. Um, and so it's a very fluid layout system, allows us to flow the text, drop the pictures in. But how did we get there? Uh, our first step, and I'm flying because we're a little behind schedule, so I'll go quick. So if we go to the next slide. Um, we first wanted to look at design from the era. So we went to the Newberry Library. We took a little field trip 
Um, that's not, that's a vintage postcard, but we'll go to the next one. Um, <clears throat> and then pulled samples. And we pulled samples from the era. And what we found um, were um, uh, printer samples from the Lakeside Press and from R.R. Donnelly. And there were a few that we identified. And this one, I loved the simplicity or the, the loose uh, line spacing of that type line spacing or letting, that's the space between lines, um, and then the vertical bar, it was really interesting. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see how we then respond to that. This is an early layout where we're using a serif typeface, we have kind of loose letting, we're using Helvetica, which would have been used at the uh, in the era. And then if you go to the next slide, you can see how through this version, we're creating a horizon across the top of the page where everything hangs down from. And the thought is, okay, let's reference the flatlands or the plains or, or kind of the flat of Chicago in the, uh, by emphasizing the horizon. If we go to the next slide, um, there's this other sample from a, the new vision, Laszlo Mahalai Naj, and I loved the anchored picture in the bottom corner. So we go to the next one. And for this one to emphasize the horizon, we're moving the text to the top, the pictures to the bottom. And this is kind of how we work with books. We make a sample layout um, before we make all 200 some pages. So if we go again, next slide, you can see how those images run along the bottom of the page. Um, let's keep going. <clears throat> and then there's this sample, which I thought was very cool, which is like this thick black horizontal line um, running across the top of the page. And so we can use that as a graphic element in the book, maybe. Next one. And we can just quickly show that. And showing it next to this building makes a nice synergy with the architecture, kind of interesting. We almost have that same horizontal nature. Um, if we go to the next one, uh, interesting in this option of saying, okay, images go above and text goes below. It's a real logical thought process of how we work with the grid, where images, where content goes. And so let's go to the, th the final one, which is our layout. Um, and in this sample, we loved sort of how we have a justified, very neat column of text, and then pictures are coming in to that column. And that's how we got to the layout where we are. So if you go to the next one, we just have a few samples from there. Oh, jumped ahead of myself. This is also a sample of uh, Playboy. Oh, next slide. Playboy magazine from the era. So this is uh, 1957, Art Paul. Um, again, these justified neat columns of text, some white space, full bleed picture on the left, keep going. And so we have layouts like this. And because we're working with historical images, we tried to preserve the tone and the color as much as possible. We tried to crop them as little as possible. So sometimes when I'm working with a contemporary image, I might just fit it to the grid and fill the image and be happy, but we're working with these images in their original proportion. So if we go to the next slide, <clears throat> you can start to see sometimes we have floor plans, sometimes we have a slightly yellowish tinted image. Let's keep going. And you can just go through these and you get a sense of how the layout has some flexibility um, and some variety built into it, um, working with this modular grid. And occasionally we have a more recent picture that's in color and so that's represented in color. Let's keep going. And then how do we select typography? We found this lovely sample. Um, this is from 1968, uh, Crate and Barrel ad. And I love, like, look at those little R's on this kind of this Crate and Barrel. You'd never see Crate and Barrel today do this. And then if you go to the next slide, um, this typeface here in the, uh, the new vision is a, it looks like a version of Futura or a geometric sans serif. So if we go to the next slide, we're using a contemporary um, typeface called circular, which has an alternative version of an R, which references that, that crate and barrel ad, which has the same geometric proportions of Futura, but it's a contemporary cut. So it's a modern typeface that's riffing on what was done in the past. And then you're looking at this and you might say, how did you get to that blue color? And Michelangelo and I had lots of conversations about color. Well, this is where it kind of gets personal. I think color can be very um, subjective. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, five years ago, I bought a house and this was the kitchen of my house and that was the countertop sample and my house was designed and or built in 1958. That was the house when I moved in. I think underneath, I have a picture of underneath that stove, there's some Revereware pots that were left in there from the previous owner, just if you're interested. And then the upstairs bathroom, if we keep go to the next one, had this. I had a lovely green sink and a lovely green toilet and a lovely green uh, bathroom. And so that color for me just was like, okay, this is the era. 
And there was even that color in a sample image that Michelangelo has shared. So that gave us a kind of like, okay, let's use that on the next slide as you know, accent throughout the book. We're using it in titles, we're using it in sidebars, we're using it to fill pages, but it just became kind of our color from the era. Um, <clears throat> keep going. And there you go. Modern in the middle, design. I think I, I did, uh, I beat my time. So I think Amina goes to you now. Thanks, bud. Um, yeah, so we have a question for Marsha. So we saw some glimpses of images from your childhood in the home designed by your father, Harry Weiss. Um, we're curious if you could share with us, what was the experience like growing up in a home where all different forms of design were part of complementary practices or part of the daily conversation, looking at architecture, design, objects. We'd love if you could share some stories from that. Well, hello everyone. Um, wish I could see you all. <laughs> but it's a pleasure to be celebrating uh, Chicago's rich history of design and architecture. And speaking of history, I was, I was actually born in the middle of modern. So, so I was born in the middle of the century. And um, of course, growing up, you know, one doesn't really know what, what's really going on until one looks back. And, um, I have to say that, that there happened to have been from Cranbrook, a, a pretty illustrious class that graduated, I, I think it was in 1940, uh, just, before World, you know, just before World War II. And these people, uh, many of whom you've already mentioned, um, Ray and Charles Eames, Aero Saarinen, Harry Batoya, Harry Weiss, Ben Baldwin, Ralph Rapson, Florence Knoll, et cetera, were great friends. And they, Harry used to call, um, Harry, it was said that Harry called Cranbrook the Scandinavian Bauhaus. And the thing that, um, for whatever reason, that particular class, uh, they all went on to become quite iconographic, amazing designers who, as you look back in history, they have made, um, they've made up uh, quite a bit of this uh, mid-century modern. But while we were all, living growing up, it was, it was a big party. I mean, they, they had so much fun. They were constantly playing off one another. There was so much invention. The architects designed furniture, the, the um, sculptors, Bertoia designed jewelry, the, the, these you know, fabrics were involved. There was so much cross um, pollination going on. And I think that you, you can, when you look at mid-century modern design, you can really see, um, you can see evidence of that, that they weren't just doing one thing. So I have some childhood memories. I, I've, I'm short on time here, but I'll just mention a few. Um, we were at, a, at Lazo and Serge Tamayev, who was, Serge was teaching at, at IIT and Lazo was running IIT at the time. They came over to dinner, they, every, all these people, came over quite a bit to dinner. And they got into this really passionate discussion about design. And it was so passionate that Serge, who was this Russian six foot two, picked up his dinner knife and brandished it at Laszlo and they, who ran into the living room. <laughs> and, and my mother had to break it up. There was no blood spilled, but the whole point is that they were talking about, no, they weren't talking about politics, they were talking about design. And this is how they lived and breathed design. Uh, every night at the dinner table, um, I didn't get to tell my family what happened at school. No, I instead listened to my father talk about how to make the city a better place, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but it was a, it was a very um, lively time. We had that folding kitchen that was shown in, in, in um, Michelangelo's slide with the black and white floor. It was black and white linoleum floor. The kitchen literally pivoted to close. My father didn't care about cooking. And so he just often would design these kitchens that would disappear and he much rather you know, have cocktail parties than make these lavish dinners. But my mother found these large checkers somewhere that must have been you know eight inches in diameter 
And we used to sit down, on the, uh, my sisters and I used to sit down and play checkers on the floor. <laughs> so this was the, just a wonderful memory of, um, of how, you know, we didn't have to put our toys away because that, that was, the floor was one of our toys. Um, the, the, um, another interesting thing that happened at Baldwin Kingry was that the, there was nothing modern in Chicago after the war, according to my mother. And um, there was, except for the exception maybe of Fairweather Hardin Gallery, there was no modern art. You couldn't go see any modern furniture. So when Baldwin Kingry opened, which was an idea Harry had when he was on a, in, world, in, in the war on a, on a destroyer for three years um, in the Navy, he had this idea to open a modern retail shop of sorts that actually became a salon. So the IIT students of design and architecture would come at lunch and bring their brown bag lunch just so they could sit in the modern furniture, read the magazines. And often they were asked to um, put the, some of the furniture together because uh, Harry went to Alto who was his professor and mentor um, and got the Midwestern franchise for Alto furniture. And this was really kicked off Baldwin Kingry. Um, so the students were thrilled because there was nowhere else, there was really nowhere else to go to experience modern. So I think Baldwin Kingry was quite seminal in um, creating a place in Chicago for people to actually experience uh, not only furniture, but uh, they sold Victoria jewelry and um, vases from. Um, uh, Vanini vases and uh, everyday simple uh, was the sort of Scandinavian ad, um, the thought that objects that when you walked into the store were affordable and simple and modern. And this is the aesthetic I grew up with. So I've always been a minimalist to quite a degree. And um, I think that back then, as my mother used to say, people had no money coming back from the war. They had no furniture. And um, Ileal Saarinen, at, who they used to call Pappy because apparently he was very friendly, used to tell his students, um, design a house and then furnish it. So this was very much a part of, don't just design the house, but design everything that goes into the house. And um, it was, I had a I had a very happy childhood. It was really it was a good time to grow up, even though we were taught to be seen and not heard. But that's another story. So back to you. Yeah, thank you, Marsha. I think what's so wonderful about some of these stories you're sharing are the presence of this cross-pollination between discipline that like one could have maybe been something by training, but did something else when they went home to, to develop and you know share with their home or their studios and everything. Um, I'm curious to build on that. Michelangelo, maybe if you could share on what are some of the shared similarities you see across disciplines, across oh. architects and designers from the 50s, 60s, and 70s? Um, just now, Marsha was sharing you know, the values of being accessible and simple and modern. Um, what are other processes or values or mindsets that we had um, architects and designers centering themselves in during this time? Well, perhaps a common interest in all things organic. Um, but by organic, I think it meant different things for different designers and architects. And uh, I mean, we are in Chicago, the uh, epicenter of Frank Lloyd Wright uh, organicism, but then Mies in his curriculum for the, the 1938 curriculum uh, explicitly made, re made reference to organicism. Uh, and so, so I guess it's uh, how does one sort of inhabit an organic object or, or, you know, or a house or a space. And I, I think a lot of that um, sort of common thread uh, was there. What do you think, Marsha? Would you agree with that? Like, because, uh, you know, the organic was not, was a kind of, there was a competition at MoMA in the post-World War years, the Eameses, Charles and Ray Eames were very much 
in that conversation, but we also, Harry took that uh, to a whole different level, right? So. Yes, I would say that he, though he respected me, um, his, he was, his real true mentor was Alto. And if you, uh, Alto is a beautiful example of organicism and the Bruno Mattson furniture that Baldwin Kingery also sold, I, I still am lucky enough to have a few pieces, but when I look over at that, at a Mattson chair that's sitting across the room, it, it looks like a person sitting over there. And there's something so beautiful about how human, human it is in that sense. And also I would say Harry was a, above all a humanist in that, in that he wanted his design to, he wanted people to be able to relate to, to the spaces. And um, Mies went a completely different direction, of course, even with his materials, use of materials. Right. Now, Bud, uh, uh, in graphic design, you know, is there an equivalent of organic? I mean, when you were talking about, uh, you know, how you could take the grid, uh, sort of more Swiss grid or Helvetica font and sort of have a little bit more flexibility. Um, I mean, is there a parallel here? And thanks, Marsha, for sharing that, uh, uh, the person analogy, I like that. But uh, how can fonts and-, and Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's an interesting comment. I mean, there's a there's a real like obvious kind of connection of, uh, you know, like moving from the rejection of modernism to postmodernism and expressiveness in in typography and in um, uh, format, right? So when we think about fonts and we think about um, like Helvetica being a very um, uh, formal, official, regulated um, typeface, um, and then we think of anything that came out, you know, uh, after the in, the in the world of postmodernism in the '80s and the '90s that became expressive, where the where the typeface itself was telling a story. The typeface itself had a design narrative to it, um, versus being a neutral vessel for content. Um, like so, there is that that express in uh, that contrast. But then we live now in a in an era where um, design. Um, so often starts uh, at the individual or at the audience with understanding who they are and what they're what they need and 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 um, what the context of what you're designing for. So then, what you design is in response to that um, actual human expressive, you know, thing. The thing that this thing is going to do. You see that very common in UX design. You see it in uh, wayfinding. You see it in identity design, right? So it's responding to that. And then and then the output or the product of that may appear more modernistic or may um, appear more postmodern, but it's coming from this place of coming from the, the person. Does that make sense? Rather than it's coming from it's coming from a place of responding to what the person needs or the human needs for the thing are versus this modernist ideal of what good design is and that needs to apply to everything. Right. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Yeah. That's great. And Bud, actually, while we have you, I'm curious, one interesting thing that, you know, you're bringing to this conversation is that SPAN is a multidisciplinary design studio. However, we're seeing a lot of design roles today being hyper segmented in a very specialized, you know, field that we have um, across different disciplines within design. You were mentioning UX design. We have information architecture designs. We have uh, design researchers. Um, these are a lot of the roles that students like myself who are either currently in school or graduating soon are looking at, you know, for what the future of our design careers is going to um, bring us into. So I'm curious, what's your response to this hyper segmentation when we're also seeing from the mid-century, we have this example of what can come out of this pluralism of practice. Um, yeah. you know, what do we gain when we specialize, but also what are we losing? Yeah, yeah, I, we're, I see as a studio, we're multidisciplinary in that we, uh, in the world of communication design, you know, practice across all media, we're working in environmental graphics, we're working in print, we're doing video, we're doing websites, you know, it's all of the above. Um, and I think that, I think that the most interesting things happen, um, at the intersections between disciplines, um, you know, that's when, when you take a little bit from this discipline and you apply that to this other discipline, um, it can change the way you're thinking about that. And that broader perspective, 
of um, design practice, I think is uh, so helpful. You know, I, I understand the, the kind of the value of um, uh, specializing and I'm a UX, I'm a UI designer, I'm a motion graphics designer because you, those thing, those um, specialties are very specific. I'm a type designer. They have their own um, uh, technical things you need to know to be like the best, of, the best at that, right? And so to specialize, you can focus on that. But I think by doing that, you talked about out of school, right away out of school, you lose that broader picture of what design can be. You know, as a studio, we get involved in so many different conversations with businesses and companies um, uh, at the at the business level, at the fundamental level of what they're doing for business. We're coming in and using our design, communication design skills to help them kind of either communicate that or clarify that or express that or, you know, define it. Um, and uh, I think that's the most exciting part about what I do is that variety. <clears throat> I think that was the whole um, thrust of, of the, the, the Bauhaus and the, and Cranbrook. Um, and I think that it brings, I think it's a very valuable thing, this cross pollinating because we, it, you know, we are not islands and it brings tremendous um, potential breadth to whatever is being designed. And so I'm, I'm happy to hear um, uh, that you're doing that. I um, <clears throat> was working for a large architectural firm a number of years back and ran a cross pollinate program where weekly we would bring someone in to sit with everyone at lunch and present something. And so it was really fascinating to be able to, I mean, at one point we brought in a, a um, Japanese tea ceremony person who told us, taught us all about that, that particular very specific um, mm. discipline and then served tea to all of us. And then, I mean, it was very, it was really varied. And I found everybody sitting at their computers, you know, hour after hour after hour working on these templates in the same over and over and over. It was such a relief to actually get the mind working in a completely different on a different tangent so i'm i'm all for that yeah we work with a lot of architects and um the conversations we have at the, the conference table with architects is very interesting because um they're talking about spatial problems right and and we're we're flattening that space often into this 2d dimension and um, uh, talking about space in terms of hierarchy and and um, <clears throat> yeah it's a it's an interesting kind of translation of uh, expressing you know how how we could get to the what the idea is you know <clears throat> graphic design is fascinating both of my sisters went to RISD and studied graphic design but I think it's so it's so much sculpture. It's so much. It is architecture. It's there's so much in that on the yeah. on the page. It. I find myself looking at uh, like the work of uh, my friend uh, Jonathan Neshi, who is a furniture industrial designer, um, and he does these beautiful, simple, pure forms. It gets down to like just the the most pure element, and. Uh, getting to that level of kind of purity of idea or concept in graphic design is a whole different um, <laughs> ball game. We, I feel like the closest you can get to that maybe in graphic design is by design, designing the type itself, you know, just getting down to the pure forms of what it is. <clears throat> yeah, what's, what's nice about this evening is we have communication, graphic design, architecture, product design, all, all together. Um, there's a shared language. We uh, all of us talk about scale and proportion and composi composition, uh, but in different ways. Um, but it's all related, and it's all part of the language of design and how we how we solve problems in our in our medium, basically. So I think mm -hmm. that's uh, that's why, like as as Amma said, like it's you can uh, go across. You can work in different disciplines because you kind of have the basis right. of uh, thinking. 
Mm -hmm. I'll add to that. Um, you know, it's interesting uh, back to the question about mid century and uh, Marsha's comment about the Bauhaus and observation about the Bauhaus and Cranbrook. It is also true that um, there's a number of schools that had art and architecture, you know, as part of their identity. Think of the Yale School of Art and Architecture, the sort of uh, Rudolph's building. So I wonder, you know, and I, I seen that uh, less and less today. So. Um, you know, we seem to be moving toward specialization. Um, you're, a, you know, you're a professor, Marty. Do you ever have um, the oddball architecture student gravitate toward uh, uh, ID? And if so, um, you know, how, how can you, like, what, you know, stories might you have uh, interesting ones to share about that? Uh, we, we get all kinds of oddballs, so. Uh, <laughs> and we kind of welcome them because uh, I think we're one of the few graduate programs in the country that welcomes not just students. I mean, students from any background. It could be publishing. It could be uh, engineers of all kinds of, uh, where's, what was Amina's background when she came through the foundation program? Sociology um, and rhetoric, so no design training. Yeah, like writers, I don't know, every, all kinds of people. So um, we, one of the things I'm, you know, truly interested in is the fundamentals of design, which is what we're kind of discussing here. Like there's, there are some, some areas or some principles um, that do go back to the Bauhaus, which still makes sense. There's some that don't uh, for our culture and today. But that's the that's the that's what we have to figure out as educators as the what's the best way to teach design and to get this cross disciplinary approach. Um, but also, I think you know, get this understanding of craft, for example. Um, the understanding which my area is in prototyping, that we're all making prototypes, uh, whether it's in communication design or architecture, and how to make those things and what level they should be. Um, these are all like fundamental skills if you want to, if you're the kind of person who wants to change the world and wants to envision something new and um, and make things better. So uh, that's, yeah, we just, we, we do get, to answer your question, yes, we do get <laughs> some architects. Uh, and uh, often they're, they're quite good students. Thank you. Great, thank you, Marty. Um, in the interest of time, I wanna to transition to a couple great Q&A questions that we have come through. Um, the first one's from Lauren Bogan. So she's asking if any of the panelists have predictions or thoughts on the design um, in the next wave of homes. So thinking about green space, energy efficiency, more private spaces, um, especially looking at the fact that today we're using our living spaces so differently now, and we may be moving more and more towards remote working as a permanent fixture. That's a really good question. Um, just briefly, it's, there's been quite a shift from what was happening in the commercial spaces uh, around off, open offices where you just had a locker mm -hmm. and you didn't, you didn't have a desk and you didn't even sit, sit down in a chair, you stood up. And <laughs> so I think that's a really interesting question because right now we can't, in the pandemic, nobody wants to be in an open office. I mean, nobody wants to be in the office at all. So. Um, I don't know, does, what do you all think about how that might transform? Well, uh, from the architecture point of view, uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, Dennis Rodkin, Crane's business, right, did a review of the, our book and he's saying, well, why, why are, you know, the mid-century modern houses uh, are, you know, going gangbusters, right? And, uh, and so, everyone seems to want to have access to purchase those. And there is a, I think there's a level of simplicity and optimism in a lot of the mid-century architecture that I think 
we've we're all a little bit um, burdened psychologically burdened by uh, this pandemic and I think uh, being surrounded by green space and by uh, cheerful well thought design without kind of being extravagant uh, which sort of exemplifies the mid century there's a kind of there's a kind of understatement, but with elegance, right? Uh, that a lot of the, whether it's Alto, wh whether it's the Eameses, and uh, and I think folks are are still hungering to get back to that. And um, uh, and so the, the access, back to Lauren's question, I think access to uh, open air spaces, pre whether it's, you know, balconies or terraces and, uh, I think is uh, is really or is on the rise, and uh, I don't think we'll go back. Even when you know we're going to be post pandemic, um, I think that appreciation for a little bit more slowness uh, might actually be one of the lasting benefits, uh, possibly, of this pandemic. Yeah, I can just speak to the, just if I can jump in on the like after or post pandemic comment, you know, and in March, uh, our office, we sent everybody home and um, we have this big office space that's just been sitting empty since then. I go in every once in a while um, and work there. Um, but but I feel like we aren't, I don't, th I don't even after, you know, we have a, um, a vaccine. I'm not sure we're going back to the office the same way we were before because this this way of working has is is going to stick for us, and I think it's going to become a bit of a hybrid, um, Marsha, to end up being some of those principles you talked of, like in our office. You know, we can we all have laptops now, so maybe we just need a few desks where people can just go sit down and do work at the office. They don't need a dedicated desk because we're all just used to working from home, and that idea of hot desking, you know. Um, when it becomes uh, the primary mode of working for us from home makes sense. I think for me, when I'm thinking about our office, I want access to um, outside space there too. So when I'm there, the office feels more like home, feels more comfortable um, rather than this tight enclosed clinical space. But is it also true, Bud, that a lot more folks need, you know, better offices at home now as opposed to before you know, uh, people were discovering that, you know, they might have had a little desk in their bedroom, <laughs> but now if they're going to be working at home, they need a little bit more space, whether that's shared or. Absolutely. I mean, you, uh, you, if you can see my room behind me, this is the guest room in our, in our home, which is now an office space. And I used to have a, I used to have my desk perched at the top of the stairs, which was fine for the occasional time I'd be working at home, but um, I needed to have a door. To kind of because I you know conference calls I can't have people just running in and out so um, totally and I think the other thing that um, is interesting from a from a business perspective of is as um, suddenly if all your employees are working from home they need to have uh, a safe place to work safe physically because if it opens up to you workers comp issues related if somebody's working from home full time and they're sitting hunched over and they don't have a good place to sit. Um, it's not healthy, right? So yeah, you need to have a good safe place to work, safe place to sit, um, absolutely. I don't think we've addressed the, the, the there's question, the part of that question around green, green space, green architecture. I'm not sure if you, she meant green, uh, green architecture or green, uh, green, you know, outdoor space, but I think, in general, we all need to get very much on the bandwagon of designing as green as we can. Like it's probably already too late, but we it's we need to try. If uh, these and, by the way, this whole lead program, I mean, I've never, you know, I did I was lead certified and I've never seen anything so insane as that as that approach to you know taking that exam and the the approach it was so it was the opposite of holistic so i think green starts you know in here at home and then it's, it's but it's, you know it rings out like a pebbles thrown into a pond and uh i'm hoping really hoping for this a younger generation to make this 
absolutely on the top of their list of um, what has to happen. If these last couple of days are any indication of the kind of uh, global warming uh, we're all feeling guilty about it. here. Uh, Marsha, you're not in Chicago right now, but uh, we've been experiencing like balmy, you know, over 50 degrees weather. So in Colorado and there's no snow, not a single flake and it's December 10th. So, but yeah, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that uh, through innovation, um, through all of the, the, I mean, I have, nieces and nephews who are who are you know brilliantly thinking about this whole issue and I have great great hope that they will uh, be able to make breakthroughs that we have not been able to make and that yet in the mid-century they did make you know as as Marty was talking about and and breakthroughs are possible we right. just have to we can't give up right <laughs> I mean, uh, in several of the examples of the houses we publish in the book, including the Kex, uh, Duncan House, I mean, they were all uh, cutting edge solar houses. And, you know, Chicago was a, um, an epicenter of uh, solar houses at Keck and even Glass's house, Passive Solar. And, and so um, I, I think what happened was, you know, um, uh, air conditioning got in the way and uh, and a lot of things that you know the mid-century still has a lot to teach in its kind of um, basic approaches to cross ventilation and uh, uh, you know passive cooling and heating approaches and so maybe we can uh, go back to the 40s and the 50s for that too <laughs> not yeah. only aesthetic but yeah pare down unclutter yeah get back to the basics Right. Although I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the houses shown in the book, uh, some of them were you know quite large and and uh, extravagant, but the others, if you half of them were not. I mean, some of them were like whatever, 600, 800 square feet, and right. a few thousand dollars, and um, single story. Yeah, and just wonderful. Uh, designs um, that were economical and, and probably energy efficient. So. Right. Well, my, uh, my uh, co-author, Susan Benjamin, says uh, this is, uh, these houses are not about the rich and famous, you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous for the most part. And they're not like the, you know, big uh, Gold Coast mansions, the Potter Palmer mansions. They're, they were actually quite, um, there's a few exceptions in the book, but the majority uh, you know, the, um, they were, you know, 2,500 square feet, uh, you know, uh, but we had like the cottage, like the Mullen House, uh, Evanston, you know, by Goldberg. And so there was many uh, very modest houses. And, and so, um, you know, as I said, uh, you know, in other times, like we, this is volume one. Uh, we often joke, maybe we need a volume two. Uh, and and so much research, um, you know, we try very hard apropos design culture and the examples that I showed in today's uh, brief presentation, but there's so much more research that needs to be done, you know, uh, in terms of, um, you know, the kind of uh, collaboration between art, art um, architects, designers, or even landscape architects, you know, uh, in our book where we could, uh, where we did research, you know, for example, the McCormick House, that was a uh, Alfred Caldwell designed landscape. Uh, and, but there's still a lot of holes in that. And so, you know, we welcome, we see this as a, you know, an opportunity to focus attention on houses in Chicago, but also, you know, invite future scholarship as it were. That's wonderful. a good idea. Yeah. Um, Marsha, we have another question in our um, chat for you coming from Paul Pettigrew. So first, mentioning he really enjoyed Bud's uh, description of the book process, found that to be really great. Um, and he said that he loves listening to your stories, Marsha. It'd be interesting in hearing any other additional stories about the relationship between the Institute of Design and Baldwin Kingery, maybe like the relationship between the school, the faculty and students, and the products sold in the store. Hmm. Well, 
Let's see, I was about two years old. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, but let me think of, uh, let's see, I know that Kitty used to tell me uh, about these stories. Actually, I uh, put together the book, Baldwin Kingry, and that's maybe a good place for him to start if he hasn't seen that. Um, Richard Wright published it. Um, I put together the team um, and I conducted a, an interview uh, just as that was, as this idea was, it was actually Ben Weiss's idea. He thought that Baldwin Kingry needed to be talked about because it was, it was uh, sort of the first of its kind really in Chicago and in the Midwest. So Judy Kingry was, was quite ill and she was dying in the hospital of a, of a, of a she had a, a terminal illness. And I knew that uh, I had to jump on this um, and I bought a little cheap tape recorder and I, Kitty and I went down to her hospital bed and I can, and they talked and I actually recorded it. And so they talked, they reminisced. Jody had the most wonderful sense of humor. She was great on the, she was a great salesperson on the floor. She had amazing stories. And my mother was a really good manager and she sort of did everything behind the scenes. Um, she was a little more shy, but they were a wonderful team. And Studio Blue, did that design that book and they did a wonderful thing where the large type that runs through the book is Jody and Kitty talking, telling these stories. And then the smaller type is, is a historian, John Brunetti put together some history. So if you haven't seen that book, um, I would say it's straight from the horse's mouth and it, way better than anything I could, <laughs> I could do. So. Yeah. Now, Marsha, thank you for that. And uh, uh, you mentioned Ben Weiss. I also want to do a shout out for uh, Cindy Weiss, who did uh, the endorsement for the cover of our book. And she mentioned that she and Ben were likely to be signing up to, uh, to attend this event. So hi, Cindy. <laughs> <laughs> and the chat uh, said that Sue Weiss was also attending our our uh, our event, so shout out to Sue as well. Yeah. So it's a it's a Weiss reunion. <laughs> yes, I wish we were all in the same room. I really do. Okay. I, I love my family, and and oddly enough, almost every single one of us. Like how many siblings? Uh, there were five children. Uh, it was Harry and his two brothers were architects. His sister was a an illustrator. His other sister, Sue, was a painter. All of their children, maybe with the exception of one, became either architects, designers, landscape designers. It's, it's rather it's sort of scary, really. <laughs> it's sort of, we had, a, we had a benevolent dictator at the helm <laughs> growing up. But it's interesting. There was somewhere in there, we were all attracted to, to that field. And somehow the way it happened and unfolded for my father, it, it seemed, it, he made it seem like it was possible. Today, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I wouldn't want to go into the field just because of the computer. Um, my father drew so beautifully, so beautifully. He was always drawing. He had a little black notebook in his pocket. He, he just drew all the time. And um, I know some architects who do draw still, and that's, that's a wonderful way to translate from, you know, the computer I think makes us a little bit lazy, but I'm not, I'm not gonna say any more about that. So <laughs> I don't wanna offend anybody. I told you I was born in the middle of last century. <laughs> Marsha, I think that's really interesting to hear, um, you know, a, a point of view that your father might have applied to today, which uh, makes me think of the final question we wanted to wrap up on, which is thinking about our birthday boy, Jay Doblin, who's uh, with whom we'd be celebrating a hundredth birthday today. Um, the last question I wanted to pose, maybe to Marty first, then I'd love for everybody to chime in. So if we were to transport Jay Doblin to our world today, I'm curious if you could share one thing that he would be most surprised by or proud of, and according to his perspective, one area we would still need to make progress on. So Marty, what do you, what do you think? It's a nice question. <laughs> I don't know if I have the absolute answer for it. Um, I think um, 
Jay would, would be happy that people were uh, trying to understand design more deeply um, and have a more expansive view of it than in, in the early, in the, in the United States in the middle of the century. Um, I think he would be surprised maybe at some of the materials that we found, you know, like fiberglass or things like that, that are not sustainable. Um, he would obviously be probably amazed at the advancements in, in, in computers uh, and how we use them today. Um, what was the rest of the question that you said? Can so you... from his perspective, where do you think we would still need to make the most progress given where we are today? Oh, the most progress. So yeah, some of the conversation tonight, um, we were talking about products. Um, certainly there's, you know, at that point in time, everything, there was no limit. Uh, there was pretty much the the old practice of just like, okay, we'll never run out of anything, um, mass production, let's just make as much as we can. And that's, that's how we're gonna achieve uh, uh, the world that we want. And I think that, I mean, to answer your question, I think that's a little bit of a su surprise. He might be, I don't know. I, I think he might be surprised that that's not the answer, um, that there's gotta be a different approach uh, and that we have, we need to do that. For example, you know, with ideas around the cir circular economy. So we do need to do this recycling. We do have to create a system where, where products uh, are either made to last much longer or we have products that we can put back into the system. Um, there's lots of uh, work in this area, but it's only brand new in the last five years. I think even the world of design is just waking up to this uh, today. And it's really just becoming moving uh, into high gear now because also not just design, but business and the government uh, are all recognizing that there's uh, a need to be, as, as Marcia said, completely green, you know, completely solar, completely hydro, completely into renewable energy. So, uh, and, and to be equitable about the things that we create uh, in the world. And uh, it's, oh. not, it's, it's for everybody, not just uh, a US centric world, <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> which it isn't. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sure the other uh, panelists have something to say about that. Bud, would you like to pick up from what Marty's sharing or um, give us anything else you think that Dobbin would be thinking about our work and world today? Yeah, you know, I think he might be surprised about um, uh, the pace at which design happens now, the speed at which something can go um, back and forth between a client, right, and you, and how fast it's expected to happen, and then um, how fast it can get produced. Um, and uh, to that end, I think he'd have an opinion about um, us needing to uh, slow down and be more considered with what we're producing as designers. Um, you know, making sure that what we produce in the world, what we put out there, uh, isn't just more landfill. Yeah. Here, here, uh, uh, brilliant, but uh, uh, I think that uh, message should apply to every single discipline and not just uh, graphic design and I think we all need to follow the slow food movement uh, and chuck the fast food movement. Uh, uh, so uh, I, now it was interesting, Doblin's descriptions when I was going through 100 designs, I mean, he was very interested in the kind of how these products were manufactured and the kind of 
iterative uh, aspects of it, which struck me as, and you know, Marty, you're more knowledgeable than I will ever be about Dublin, but it struck me that that was really coming from someone that worked through processes, you know, from design to prototyping and, you know, uh, all the way through. Yeah, I think, I mean, we, I mean, the other thing I'd add to Bud's thing is like the, there is a, there's a much more appreciation of the unintended consequences of design today than there was then. Um, you know, if you read through all of his book, it was design, industrial design, and, and design was in the service of industry, no doubt. Like that's, that was the world then. Um, and now design has to be in, in the service of a larger goal. Um, and that's, that's the bigger problem, I think. The other thing I was gonna bring up was the, uh, you know, lots of people got credit for design where I was gonna bring up the issue with Lawrence Knoll um, in the way I teach design. <laughs> Part of, the, part of the problem with design is same in architecture and, and communication design is like, and, and I would say it goes back to my, one of the people I respect is Bill Buxton. Like the person who defines what the problem is that you're gonna work on, that's such a huge part of the design problem. Like Florence Null, she, she defined the problem for the womb chair, yet she, yes, she's credited, but not for the design, Sarna is. So I think, I mean, I I think just the inclusiveness of everyone who is involved, because like that is, when we teach design, um, what it is we choose as the problem is, is one of the big moments in, in the development of any project. And then we typically diverge to a lot of ideas and then converge down to a single solution. Um, but that initial question or opportunity space and how we decide what it is, whether it's a building or a product or a book, uh, we have to be, that's a huge moment. And, and I think we're becoming more and more conscious of of that particular part of the design process. Fantastic. Um, Marsha, would you like to share any final thoughts on maybe what Doblin would have to say about where we are today? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't really have uh, a relationship to, to him. So I, I'm gonna defer to all of you. I'm really interested to hear uh, what you've all said, and I'm in complete agreement that we've, you know, we hit the fast forward gas pedal, and now we need to, we need to slow down and um, work from within, uh, you know, to just work more deeply, as Marty mentioned, and uh, be more kind, really. <laughs> That's my <laughs> message. <laughs> Here in my quarantined house, <laughs> just be more be more human yeah it's a, it's a tough tough world i really commiserate with um young designers coming into this world uh, i have great hope and and i have a lot of empathy because you know in the 50s you know in this era the world was their oyster there was so little competition. There was, you know, their, their, their slate was clean, wiped clean. So they, they could start anew. And now we have a lot, a lot on our plate. But like I said, um, things, good things can happen if we put our heart to it, so. That's lovely, thank you. What a good note to end on to, for us to start with kindness. Um, I'd like to pass it to Tanner to help us wrap up tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amina. I wish it didn't have to end. Uh, thanks, Michelangelo and Marty and Marsha and Bud and Kristen behind the scenes and Lauren behind the scenes. Uh, and thank you to IAT and ID for hosting this event. 
As a reminder, if you'd like your own copy of this gorgeous book, you can find it at iit.bncollege.com. We'll provide links to tonight's recording and other programs mentioned tonight in an email to come tomorrow. And finally, join the Institute of Design on January 27th for a conversation with Gretchen Bakke, author of The Grid, who will discuss this complex system design and sustainability challenge. You can find more information on the Institute of Design website at id.iit.edu. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a great night um, and thanks for coming. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Amina.